Now on to another one of my most favorite locations all of chapter two. We have the Lost Spire of Netheril. This is going to take us only a little bit outside of the realm of Ten Towns, but what we find there is absolutely amazing. It's a great foreshadow for the end of the campaign because we get to get into actually a little piece of the city that we will be arriving in. But what's also important here is we can find someone who we should have seen already dead, but they are not dead in fact, or at least they aren't completely dead, but we'll be getting to all that in a moment. What we will find at the Lost Spire of Netheril is astounding, but how do we get your players to get to the Lost Spire of Netheril? Let's go ahead and check out the rumors and the quest involved with it. For the tall tale of 10 towns, we have this story. Did you hear what happened to the evil wizard Nastehaven? They tied him to a stake and lit him on fire. Why? Because he hired some ten towners to help him find a buried tower, then killed him to keep the location secret. Well, one of them told me where the tower is at, and I wouldn't go myself, but maybe it's something you'd like to explore. <laughs> so, obviously this can't be just some random commoner that the players interact with. This should be definitely something tied to more of the grand sense of the campaign. Hopefully it's at least some NPC the players have gotten to know a little bit better. Maybe one of the tavern owners in particular of any one of the towns, really. Because, you know, just someone randomly saying this off the street. Oh, I know why that guy got killed. Because he killed those people that went there and he killed them to keep it secret. Obviously, that shows that he did a sloppy job. But two, you also have to have some realm of believability. This is a little bit stretching it, but you can definitely warp it to make it believable without a shadow of a doubt. For the quest to take us to this location, we have the hunt for the Red Yeti. Basically with this one, it shows off that Yetis are getting bolder and bolder and are attacking Ten Towners when they're going fishing. So the local towns are putting on a price of 100 GP for every dead Yeti brought back to town. The thing about it is though, is that there is a particular Yeti that's doing a tremendous amount of damage called the Red Yeti. And the reason why this Yeti in particular is red is because it is coated in the blood of its victims. Your characters won't be the only one prompted to go out and get Yetis though. Of course, if you tell someone, hey, 100 GP to kill some Yetis, of course people are going to get excited to that. But the thing in particular is there is this one hunter named Milbor Talferic. And Milbor is going to go ahead and say, hey, I know the red Yeti is located around here somewhere. How about we put a bet of 300 GP to see who gets this kill? Once your players go out to the location where they think the Red Yeti is, they are unfortunately going to stumble across the Lost Tower. And they might be prompted to go ahead and search this Lost Tower. And maybe you can even hint that the Yeti stayed at this tower for a little bit. Like there's footprints leading to the Spire. And that can prompt them to go ahead and explore inside. But they're not going to find the Red Yeti. And if you follow this little quest prompt here, Unfortunately, they're always going to lose, and the Red Yeti is going to be killed by the incomparable Milbor Talferic. So, there's a little thing about this is, one, even though this guy does have the stat block of a gladiator, he still is only one guy, and it seems really unbelievable to me that only a single dude is going out there and exploring. So, one thing I would do to zhush up this little quest here is, give Milbor some groupies that are hanging out with him, and maybe he does do a lot of the grunt work, but maybe all of his followers are like, you know, clerics and priests and stuff that can go ahead and slap some heels on him. And maybe he's got a porter that's always hanging around and handing him a new weapon to beat up on. Give it some believability that he's not just going out into the middle of the wilderness by himself. Give him some companions to help sell the idea that this guy is one, popular, and two, you know, has garnished himself a little following. The other thing that sucks about this quest is, of course, the fact that your players always lose. You know, it does seem very railroady that they always lose. You should always give them the possibility that there is a Red Yeti around here, and the fact that they should be able to have a chance to get it. And you can have it be some sort of roll-off where it's, you know, Milbor's group versus the party's group, and you, they roll survival checks and perception checks and investigation checks to try and hunt down the Red Yeti as well as, you know, tackle all the other yetis that are around this place. So keep those things in mind if you're going to go ahead and run this quest. But let's go ahead and think of some other reasons why your players could head up to the Lost Spire of Netheril. As stated before, introducing the Arcane Brotherhood early is a really good way to get a 
grander scale of the campaign and maybe let slip some rumors about Netheril and the Lost City and just making friends that your players can go ahead and meet. And that is a really good incentive because if you introduce Zan early on in the campaign and your players actually get to talk to Zan and he, you know, let slip some thing about, oh yeah, I'm going to go check out some location, haha. Ha. But then later on, your players get to see Zan get killed in East Haven. And then later on, they also get to discover that there's a simulacrum of Zan in the Spire. That is amazing because your players can try and be like, oh man, is this guy on the up and up? Is his simulacrum just as bad as he is? You can spin it so many different ways. And, you know, having that realization of meeting someone that the players have known and watching them die and then finding a copy of them, that's interesting. So one thing I would recommend is after your players have watched Zan get killed on the pyre in East Haven, they can go ahead and quickly search his house or uh, his apartment or his hut or whatever he's got going on in East Haven and find some notes. And those notes are going to lead them directly to the Lost Spire of Netheril. And, you know, working off some dead guy's notes, taking them to a location, and then, of course, discovering that copy, that is awesome. Of course, another thing you can say is the fact that the Lost Spire doesn't have to be in that exact location, like most of the locations, except for the ones that are directly tied to the coast, of course. You can move them all over the place. The Lost Spire doesn't have to be directly on this mound over here. It could be absolutely anywhere. And once again, I always like that idea of your players are traipsing around the wilderness and they're about to get lost and they're about to go bed down and they see a place where they can theoretically hunker down and they decide, hey, let's go ahead and check this place out and see if it's safe. There is a lot of ways your players can go ahead and stumble across the Lost Spire of Netheril and each one is completely unique and you know will shape up how their perceptions are of what they're getting into. And speaking of what they're getting into, let's go ahead and dive into the map and see what they're going up against. So what's really cool about this map is, of course, we get these four little sections of the tower that they're going to be walking around in. But we also get an image of what the spire used to look like on the left when it was attached to the city. And we also get an image of what it would look like if they somehow had a side view and, you know, of course, we're able to see through the ice. So that is a really good visualization for you to show off, you know, what this spire looks like. And unfortunately, it's kind of hard to justify showing these to your players until they've done it or you give them some type of vision or something. But feeding this image to your players is a pretty cool thing to do. But I would recommend having your players explore the entirety of this place and then showing off what it looks like. Looking into this area, we get some good information on the Lost Spire of Netheril and how it broke off from the city and how a wizard was part of the spire and died and he was actually the owner of the Shield Guardian, which is located in Karkalok. And we also get some good information on Zan. When he showed up, he cleared the place out and more importantly, the adventurers uh, basically took a lot of the useful items around here and useful books. And how it states that Zan had a simulacrum, and the simulacrum is just chilling here. When your players arrive on foot, they're going to see this 20 foot high structure. And the flavor text here is, it states that it's smooth and shiny surface cannot possibly be, have been worn down by the wind. No, this protrusion looks utterly out of place, as if it had been thrust into the ground. So, that right there is obviously going to tip off what the players are probably going to get into. I'd probably go ahead and cut that down a little bit, saying this looks unnatural. But what you should obviously show off is the fact that there is a hole that leads directly down. And that is presumably going to be the only way your players are going to be able to get into the Spire of Nethero. If your players look around, they'll be able to find a 5 foot diameter tunnel that enters the ground at a steep angle, then winds down into the frozen earth. And what it states here is if they don't have any climbing gear at all, then they're going to have to make a DC 15 athletics check or slide all the way down and land in area 1. But safe and sound though, it's just a fun little slide that goes all the way down. For the overview of the spire, we get the following information. Everything is upside down. So as previously stated, this thing crashed and fell upside down. So everything is, of course, you know, where it would be upside down. Which is cool because, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that have crashed down from the ceiling and are now just scattered all about. For illumination, in every single corridor and room, there is a continual flame that has been cast in there to some degree, so the place is completely lit. The funny thing is, though, is your players are going to know that this is magical flames, because the flames will actually be pointing to the ground, i.e. the ceiling, 
And, you know, flames, normally they flicker up, but these flames are going to go ahead and flicker down. And that'll just show off how these things are totally magical and they give off no heat. For the room and door heights, we get the information that all rooms and hallways are 12 feet high. But what's funny is the door heights are only 8 foot high. Normally, if you're walking through, you just walk on through no problem. But the issue is because this thing is turned upside down, there's a four foot barrier you have to hop over every single time you want to go from room to room, which is pretty funny. And lastly, we get tunnels. When the shield guardian was trapped in here for some time, it eventually decided to break out and it just punched holes right through the ceiling. This is the only way your players are going to be able to make their way down because as we'll see in a bit, there is a staircase to this location, but the issue is, is that the staircase, one, it wouldn't work, but two, it, there's a whole bunch of rubble that has been blown in there, and thus your players have to go down these holes to go further down. Once your players either march their way down or unceremoniously slide down, they will arrive in area one, the upside down entrance. In here, they'll be able to find some statues that are just to the side of a door, the thing is, these statues used to have protections, but they faded oh so long ago. You should probably add a little flair to this. Maybe the statues emit a light for a second, just a brief little arcane flash, but they aren't able to do any actual spells or any damage or anything. They just flicker with life. And it can really show off to your players that this place is full of magic, but it is long since worn off. In area two, we have the upside down corridor. After your players, you know, graciously hop over the four foot barrier to get inside here, They'll be able to see that there is a staircase that leads up, question mark, it, it, you know, it actually is supposed to lead down. But the thing is, the place is completely overrun with rubble, and thus they cannot go further in. They have to go to either one of the doors to the side, and that is going to lead us to area three, the upside down library. Once your players make their way inside the library, they'll be able to look around and see, of course, everything has been torn asunder because everything crashed and blew up during the crash landing of this place. But there is still some books laying around here, and three of the books in particular are Magical Wonders of Netheril. This book foreshadows the Mithalar, which your players will be able to interact with in Chapter 7, the Necropolis. But the thing is, is it only talks about interviews discussing this stuff. You shouldn't give them full-blown details about the Mithalar because, you know, saving that information for later is way more fun. However, it does include sketches of such devices, so maybe you could go ahead and hand the players some crude drawings of what appears to be like a sun, you know, contained by several spires. And if your players are super nerds and held on to a book they found oh so long ago, this is in fact a complete and finished version of a book they could have found in previous part of the campaign. The second book found here is Mysteries of the Ferrum, and this is just talking about telepathic monsters that are found in the underdark and there is disturbing sketches of them if i were running this as a call of cthulhu adventure this is totally where i'd make my players roll a sanity check because uncovering all the horrors that lurk below is terrifying and the last book we have here is wizards in the hollow the birth of the netherese empire is chronicled in the otherwise dull plotting story of the lives of three netherese wizards so once again, if you have that nerd in the group that loves all the lore and stuff, you should go ahead and draft up something. Or you could, of course, do the fun thing where you say, hey, what did the Netherese do? Go, and you award inspiration or other such various uh, rewards for, you know, basically group storytelling. Also found in Area 3 here is the Tunnel Down. Your players will be able to look down and see that this is the only way they can go further down into the Spire. We're not given an exact number on how far down it is to get to the next level, but I would go ahead and say it's around 15 feet because each ceiling is 12 feet high and presumably there is a decent amount in between those areas. Meaning that if anybody were to just go ahead and unceremoniously jump down, they would take a d6 point of damage. So they would probably have to lure themselves down correctly and use some type of rope or other material to make their way down safely. In area four, we have the upside down workshop. Get used to me saying upside down a lot. There is several tables that have been shattered and broken in here. But what's interesting is if your players go ahead and say, I look around the area, then you can just go ahead and tell them they find an iron key. And this iron key is gonna lead us into area five, the upside down potion storage. In this room, your players will be able to see that there is a chest bolted to the floor, the floor, mind you, being the ceiling meaning that they have to go ahead and crane their arms up to go in and interact with this thing. 
Players that find the key in Area 4 can go ahead and just use the key right there and open up the chest. Or if they don't find it, then they can go ahead and use a DC-15 dexterity check with Thieves tools to go ahead and open it. But the funny thing is, is what is alluded to in the little text chat here is the floor of this room is covered in shards of glass. And if they go ahead and don't really take, you know, notice of that, or they're just not prepared, when they open the chest, four potions are going to go ahead and drop out of this thing. And if you don't have people on the ready, ready to catch these things, or they don't do some type of precaution to make sure that nothing hits the floor, then all these potions are going to go ahead and hit the ground. These potions are potions of acid resistance, cold resistance, fire resistance, and force resistance. The force resistance is a big deal because almost nobody gets force resistance ever in any campaign ever. The funny thing is, here is, if no precautions are taken, then the potions tumble out of the open chest and shatter onto the floor. Any creature underneath the chest can go ahead and use a DC 10 dexterity saving throw to try and catch a potion. Meaning that if you have two dexterous people, then they would be able to capture it if they had their hands free. I would just go ahead and say that for each hand, you simply go down the line of the first one you try and catch is the acid one, the second one you try to catch the cold one, etc, etc. And if they fail their checks in that order, or if they don't do any precautions at all, then they go ahead and those potions just crash the ground and never to be used again. So hopefully your players have some foresight to gather more people around the chest, or maybe they put down a pillow or something of that nature. Once your players climb their way down, they'll arrive in Area 6, the Upside Down Laboratory. In here, they'll be able to discover metal cages, and in one of these cages is actually the corpse of a Thrykreen. Uh, we don't get any text on the Thrykreen here because there wouldn't be any in this module. But Thrykreen are essentially ant people. And presumably this Thrykreen was being used for some type of experiment and was just held here and died alongside the rest of the denizens of the Spire. Your players will only be able to know if it is a Thrykreen if they've either one come across Thrykreen or two if they succeed on a DC 20 nature check. Making their way through the tower in Area 7, they will find the Upside Down Apprentice's Study. And once again, there is more damaged furniture in here and they'll be able to look around and discover more books. Something I neglected to mention about these books is these books wouldn't be written in common. The Netherees didn't actually do business in common. The Netherees would have been using their own language for most of so long ago. But for the sake of brevity, more often than not, most people are not going to have a Netherese language unless you use one of the secrets found in our secrets tab here. Uh, or, of course, if you, one of your players had the ability to read everything using the Warlock site or had Comprehend Languages. So it just makes everything a lot simpler if you just go ahead and have everything written in common. The first book your players will be able to find in Area 7 here is Adjumar's Guide to the Fantastic. This book was essentially Illusion Magic 101 and was required reading for the Netherese classrooms. It describes the common use of illusion spells. The second book found here is The Unfettered Mind. This lunatic text discusses how one might exist solely as a disembodied brain preserved for eons in a magical suspension fluid. It includes sketches of brains in jars. And your players might just go ahead and, you know, see this information and think that's stupid. But later on in the campaign, your players actually have the option to become brains in jars. So that is, once again, excellent foreshadowing. In Area 8, we have the Upside Down Reading Room. And as soon as your players walk in here, you should immediately tell them that they immediately lose all hearing. Basically, any type of shuffling that was from outside, they can't hear. If they say anything, they can't hear anything. Nothing makes any noise. The reason for that is because this was a permanent study room, and there was a permanent silence cast upon this place so that people could go ahead and study in peace. You know, that is awesome. It, it makes sense that really powerful mages would go ahead and cast a permanent silence somewhere so they can go ahead and avoid all of the you know, nonsense outside and get some studying done. In Area 9, your players can go ahead and find the collapsed staircase. And once again, they'll be able to look and see that this place should connect to somewhere, but they just can't actually get anywhere. But here, your players will actually be able to find a skeleton. There is a skeleton in tattered robes, and it is the remains of a apprentice wizard that died during the crash. If your players examine the skeleton, they'll be able to notice something in particular. You should totally present that the skeleton looks pretty well preserved. Except for something very important, it is missing a ring finger. And the reason for that is because the, some scumbag adventurers that beat your players to this location went ahead and took a ring off of this guy's bony finger. So that'll teach your players for showing up to a place that's already been looted. 
In area 10, your players will be able to open up this door and see that there is a spiral staircase, which once again should lead somewhere, but they just can't access it. If your players get, for some reason, the crazy idea to try and excavate this rubble using some type of magics or just saying, hey, we're just going to divert a whole bunch of man hours to doing it, you should probably allow them to do it because it doesn't change anything about this encounters, really. All it changes is the fact that instead of having to go up and down these holes, they can go ahead and try and walk along the ceiling. But, you know... That's entirely your prerogative, and more importantly, if your players are willing to put in the man hours to do it. Climbing down the hole in Area 6 is going to lead your players to Area 11, the Upside Down Laboratory. Your players will be able to see two doors, but what's also interesting is the fact that there is a hole in the wall, and the reason for that was because there was a secret door that was laid up here, but some previous expedition went ahead and just battered the thing down, and it'll give them access to Area 13. But as your players look around Area 11, you'll get some good information on the laboratory. And it's here where if your players generate enough noise, then Zan's simulacrum is going to go ahead and come on out and say, Hey guys, uh, how's it going? If your players search around long enough, they will be able to find a key which unlocks a chest in Area 15. But they also be able to find a sealed scroll tube made of chartolin. Inside of this is a spell scroll of invisibility stamped into a rolled up piece of golden foil. The Chartolin tube is safe to handle. But that is a cool concept of the fact that your players can find some Chartolin here. And if they already have some interactions with Chartolin, then they might get spooked about this and try and handle it all carefully. But if your players have had no interaction with Chartolin at all, then maybe you go ahead and slip something of when the person touches it, they feel a weird sensation in the back of their neck or something. You can go ahead and seed a little bit of mystery and possible horror into the Chartolin. In area 12, we have Snow and Shadow. This is where Zan's simulacrum and his undead assistant slash bodyguard, Krintus, is hanging out. This is where we get a lot of good information on how to roleplay Zan's simulacrum and Krintus, as well as how they will be going and telling your players what's going on around the spire, why they're here, and what they're doing. And as I've previously stated, if your players already know who Zan was, then going up and telling this guy, oh, hey, you know, we know you, but the simulacrum doesn't know them. That's an awesome, you know, little roleplay encounter of, oh, yeah, we met you like a week back. Don't you remember us? And he won't remember because he's been a simulacrum for a while. Another thing to consider is your players might have seen Zan die on the pyre. And if your players go ahead and tell the simulacrum this, he's probably going to have an existential crisis of, oh, I'm dead, but, you know, I'm me. So you can go ahead and have that really honest conversation about what it means to be alive and what it means to be yourself and all those things about what is the true self and what is spirituality. You can have these really, really in-depth discussions about it, what it means to truly be alive. And Zan will, of course, want to live. If for some reason your players go ahead and attack Zan and Krintus, Krintus is going to go ahead and try and cover his master and Zan is going to go ahead and use every spell in his repertoire to go ahead and go on out of there. Because Zan is a simulacrum and made of ice, he can go ahead and just go out into the middle of the wilderness and not do anything. He doesn't need to eat, you know, he doesn't care about the cold, so he can go ahead and go in any direction to try and save himself. If your players search around the area, they'll be able to find the amulet. And this amulet is a pretty big deal because it leads to a shield guardian. And the shield guardian, as previously stated, is a fantastical creature. This thing is, once again, shoehorned into every D&D module for some reason. But it can make for an excellent companion to the party because it is super strong and can store spells and can take the heat off of the melee and do a whole bunch of other things and is a great way to get your players moving around the area of Icewind Dale. How most Shield Guardian Amulets works is you just wear it and it commands no problem. This one in particular, to get your players to actually go to the location, it requires that your players go all the way within 10 feet of the Shield Guardian to go ahead and use it to restore the Shield Guardian to work. Once someone actually attunes to this item, they'll be able to automatically know the direction and the distance to the area. Meaning that if your players haven't done Karkalok, and this is a good way to all of a sudden have your players traipsing around the wilderness to go ahead and get to that place. And once they finally get there, they're going to say, oh great, there's a fortress in the way. Awesome. 
In this area, we are given four books which your players can go ahead and find. We have The Lost Scrolls of Sabriel, and this is written in Elvish, and it is a very, very ancient tome, and it is talking about the bygone empire that collapsed 40,000 years ago, which is incredibly a long time ago. We get the book From Shadow, Substance, and this is what Zan's Simulacrum is probably really keen on. It talks about how to make illusions real, and with commentary and criticism from noteworthy Netherese illusionist. So this is definitely a way your players can go ahead and gain some insight on how much studying this guy is doing, as well as what they might find later on in the Spire. The third book, Here Lies the King. An elaborately plotted novel features an illusionist who uses magic to impersonate a prince, supplant a king, rule a fictional kingdom for 61 years, and fake his own death. You know, once again, I think this is definitely one of those books where you can go ahead and say, all right, how did the prince do this? And then what did he do when he was king? And, you know, what did he do when he was running the kingdom? You could definitely have that fun little world building element of, you know, crafting a story together and handing out whatever inspiration or XP or whatever reward you want. And lastly here, we get a book, Ventitost. And Ventitost is a testimonial and conspiracy theory book about the destruction of one of the Netherese cities, Ventitost. Ventitost was disintegrated as it flew over the forest of Cormanther nearly 2,000 years ago, and this was before the fall of Yithrin. So that is, once again, some good insight as to how these cities uh, were crashing all over the place. But two, it could be very interesting to see why this city in particular crashed. Your players at some point are going to be able to figure out why the city of Yithrin crashed, but they won't be able to find that out until they finally get there. But there could be some good insight as to why it possibly happened, and maybe you could even allude to all that stuff later on. The particular reason why the city of Yithrin crashed is because an anti-magic field went up and drowned the city and it crashed into the ice below. Regardless of how your players know Zan or don't know Zan, Zan will go ahead and just tell everything that he knows about the Spire and he'll say, oh, I know that in this location there's this and that and all that. And he'll definitely tell the players about the Basilisk in the floor below. But I'll be getting into more on how exactly he and Krintess will go ahead and roleplay out once we are done with all the locations. In Area 15, we have the Upside Down Shrine. This shrine, if your players are able to suss it out with a DC 15 religion check, are able to discover that it is a symbol of Mistra, the god of magic. If one of your players walks up to this altar and touches the symbol carved in the front of the altar, and that person has the ability to cast spells, then a potion is going to all of a sudden appear and fall right down, because once again, much like the chest below, the potion should be on the altar, but is going to go ahead and fall. So once again, there's a DC 10 dexterity saving throw in order to try and catch this thing. So hopefully whoever's going up and touching this thing has some free hands to try and catch it. If they catch this potion, they will discover that this potion is pretty dope. If you drink this potion, you permanently gain the ability to cast Minor Illusion Cantrip, which is pretty dope. It uses intelligence as your spellcasting ability, which unfortunately for most spellcasters is not their preferred spellcasting, but for Minor Illusion, it really shouldn't matter. If the character already knows the Minor Illusion Cantrip, or if the character cannot cast spells, then sadly nothing happens and the gift is wasted. And no, you cannot go up and touch this thing 50 billion times and get 50 billion potions. Once one such flask has been created, the altar becomes non-magical. So hopefully someone catches this thing and hopefully someone drinks it that doesn't already know that spell. Climbing down from area 11, your players will arrive in area 14, the upside down refectory. If your players actually talk to Zan, he will go ahead and say, hey, there's a basilisk down there, so be careful. And in fact, actually, one cool thing you could have Zan say is, hey, I know basilisk are hardcore, but I know for a fact that if you race past that area and take a left, you can go ahead and find a mirror, and maybe you can use that mirror against the basilisk. So you can definitely play this combat up as very intriguing. Your players are going to go ahead and drop right in, presumably one at a time, because of how tight this tunnel is and how long it takes to climb down. And all of a sudden, this basilisk is going to go ahead and strike. And basilisk, as always, are a scary thing. You know, these things are looking at you and trying to get you to turn to stone because, you know, that makes their lives a lot easier if you just turn to stone. And presumably, if your players are not dumb, they're going to go ahead and close their eyes and trying not to get stonified. 
One thing to help solidify Zan's connection with the party is to have Krintus, his white, go ahead and join the party for the fight. Zan does not want to get into fights because he cannot heal and he's limited on resources. But, you know, his undead assistant, sure, why not have him join in the fight and help out the party? How your players actually go ahead and tackle the Basilisk is entirely up to them, but of course it can be done in many different ways. They can try and lure it somewhere, they can try and, you know, show the reflection to it, they can just go ahead and drop down and beat up on it. You know, there's a lot of ways they can go ahead and handle it, but you should go ahead and just roleplay the Basilisk as it should be. It is just simply chilling in here, and if something comes around, it's going to go ahead and try and kill it. Once again, your players make their way into a hallway, and they'll be able to see that there's a door down the end, and that leads to a spiral staircase, which is completely unusable, unless, of course, they divert a tremendous amount of time to fixing it, but that doesn't really matter. In Area 15, we will find the Upside Down Bedchamber, and it's here where the wizard, in particular, the one that owned the Shield Guardian, their body can be found here. If your players decided to go ahead and touch the corpse of the Netherese wizard, then the wizard's evil spirit, which manifests as a will-o'-wisp, is going to go ahead and strike out at the party. And of course, dealing with invisible foes is a complete nightmare. This will-o'-wisp is going to go ahead and shock someone and go invisible and harass the party. And this will-o'-wisp is no dummy either. This thing will try and single out individuals if they are alone and will totally try and murder someone. But, at the same time, this thing cannot leave the Spire. So if players, you know, join up as a group and leave the Spire, then the Will-O-Wisp can't do anything. So hopefully your players are able to find a way to deal with this Will-O-Wisp that is harassing them. Once again, if your players search around a little bit more, they'll also be able to find the mirror mounted on the north wall, which can be broken or taken down, which they could totally use to fight off the Basilisk. For treasure in this room, if your players search high and low, they're not going to be able to find anything with their eyes, but they'll be able to find that there is in fact an invisible chest located behind the bed. Anybody who found the key in the previous area will be able to just go ahead and pop this baby open, but if you did not find the key, then it will require a DC 17 dexterity check with thieves tools in order to open this thing. But it will be with disadvantage if the chest is invisible. You're literally just like picking at nothing and your lockpicks are interacting with the air. Which will be interesting because normally you wouldn't be able to see what your lockpick is truly interacting with. You normally operate by feel. But being able to see it would be an interesting thing. The chest weighs 25 pounds. It is airtight, watertight, and magical. Of course it's magical. It's freaking invisible. But it is magical with an interior because inside of it is chilled to a cool 68 degrees at any given time. The chest itself can be sold for 100 gold and, you know, mind you, that'd be a pretty dope chest to have. An invisible chest you could go ahead and pluck somewhere and whatever you put in there is preserved. You know, that's awesome. Inside the chest, your players will be able to look and see a dope wizard's spellbook. Presumably this thing is stacked, it is huge. Unfortunately, after the chest is opened, then the book will disintegrate and turn to dust and whatever spells it once contained are lost forever. Which really sucks because if you definitely have a wizard in the group and they love getting their hands on spell books, then they're really going to be disappointed that this thing went and crumbled. If you have any type of spell at all whatsoever that can somehow preserve the nature of this and your players use that to their effect, then go ahead and reward them and go ahead and write up what type of spell book this is and what spells are listed in there. But unfortunately, there's not too many spells floating around that could possibly try and save this book. But if your players get creative, then reward them. But more often than not, this thing is going to be lost. And that's probably for a good cause, because if your players got themselves an awesome spell book with, you know, maybe 6th, 7th, 8th level spells, then they're unfortunately going to be sitting there and not going to be able to use them for quite some time. In Area 16, we have the Upside Down Rune Chamber. This is what Zan's Simulacrum is aiming for. Because located in this room are runes which presumably transform illusions into reality. And Zan thinks to himself, hey, I'm like not real. Maybe this thing can go ahead and make me real. When your players walk in, they'll be greeted by an illusion which will go ahead and say, hey, behold my masterpiece. Here illusions can become real. Shadows become substance. Create your illusion. Let it stand atop the crystal disc and watch my rune chamber do its work. But it does specifically state that this language comes out as Loros. It does specifically state here in Loros the Netherese tongue that Loros the Netherese language was in fact written using draconic symbols but it was spoken aloud using the elvish tongue meaning that if you have people that can read a draconic and you have people that can actually speak elvish you should be able to translate 
which I find a little bit finicky. That's sort of like a cross between English, Spanish, and Latin. Yeah, the roots are the same, but you wouldn't be able to understand it. But whatever, you know, you do whatever you believe is right. Which, to be fair, you know, translating things just makes your game so much more simpler. Once inside this room, your players are going to have to spend a little bit of time researching all of the runes and crystals around here. And that is the fascinating thing about this area, is the fact that Zan's Simulacrum cannot learn anymore. Once Simulacrums are created, they no longer have the ability to learn. So unfortunately, the burden of knowledge is going to be tied to your players. If your players spend a minute in here and succeed on a DC 15 Arcana check, they can verify that the purpose of this area is to transform illusions into reality. But if the check succeeds by five or more, they are also able to learn the following. This rune chamber cannot produce magical items, animated objects, constructs, or undead. This area needs a life spark in order to create the illusions into reality. And that's another reason why Zan couldn't possibly do this is because his homeboy hanging out with him is undead. You know, he doesn't have a life in him. And lastly, and most important of all, there is cracks in the walls that have ruined some of the runes in here, and it could create unexpected results. And this is incredibly powerful because, as we'll get to in a moment here, there is a rollable table here which will determine the fate of anything that is used in the illusions. So your players are able to find out that you place whatever illusion you want here on the rune, and then once you touch it, that is when the magic happens. And this is, of course, where we get into the rune chamber effect here. Once any illusion is placed onto the rune and is given the spark of life, then all of a sudden you roll that d100 and we see what happens. On a 1 to 10, the illusory object is destroyed, and if this was Zan's simulacrum, it instantly drops to 0 HP and collapses into a pile of ice and snow. At which point, I'm willing to bet Krentis is going to be pissed and confused, and you guys are going to be like, oh no! On an 11 through 50, the illusory object is transformed into a hostile blob of corrosive, gross, magical ectoplasm, and is essentially a black pudding. The black pudding is just immediately going to go ahead and attack the party, and this is hilarious, especially if it is Zan, because Zan gets to save there and say, I want to live! Yay! And then all of a sudden transforms into this blob that is going to go ahead and hunt the party. That is epic, terrifying, and hilarious. On a 51 through 90, the object ceases to be an illusion and in fact becomes real for 2d12 hours, after which it is destroyed and winks out of existence. And lastly, on a 91 to 100, the object or creature ceases to be an illusion and becomes real permanently. However, once this happens, the crystal disc burns out and the chamber can no longer function. So if you have some scumbag players, they might think to themselves, oh, we can make illusions real. Let's go ahead and make some weapons. Let's go ahead and, you know, just make illusions of gold. Let's do this, this, and that. I promise you there's a lot of scumbag players out there. In fact, I had one of those scumbag players. One of my players tried making his shadow blade because he was an Eldritch Knight. He put his shadow blade here and tried making the thing real. So I went ahead and rolled, and the first time it rolled into a black pudding, and it was awesome. And the guy just wouldn't let up, and he's like, you know, screw this, I'm going to use it again, and <laughs> try summoning another black pudding, essentially, which was hilarious. So how are your players going to actually figure out what's going on with this device? They might just start producing illusions and trying to see how it actually works. If they get attacked by black puddings, I promise you they're probably going to be like, yeah, maybe we should lay off this thing. But if you roll one of the other ones, such as it becomes real for 2d12 hours, which is more than likely you're going to get one of those two options, then they'll be like, oh yeah, this thing works, it's awesome. Hey Zan, maybe you should go ahead and try it out. And if you are an agent of chaos and leave everything up to the dice rolls, then go ahead and leave it up to the dice rolls and see what happens to Zan. However, with only a 10% chance of Zan actually living this encounter, that kind of sucks. So if you really like the idea of Zan becoming whole again, then go ahead and just say, hey, you know, he becomes real. Or another thing you can do is have Zan become permanent for a little bit of time, and during that time, he sits there and says, oh, oh, I know for a fact I'm gonna die. I've gotta do something quick and adjust this thing and have him try and save this area by rolling some dice and trying to fix the rune. You can definitely have this encounter be time sensitive where you're trying to recreate the runes and try and fix the room and try and give this guy some life because he knows he's about to die unless he actually uses the thing to the best of his ability. But what happens if he isn't given that chance? What if your players go in here and once again, you know, they try to make some a pile of gold become real and they do actually roll a 91 to 100 and they make this pile of gold real? 
then unfortunately the machine's gonna blow up and it's foobar and the most unfortunate part is the fact that Zan cannot learn he is a simulacrum so he's just gonna be sat there thinking to himself oh I, I can't learn how to fix this thing and I'm just trapped here this sucks and he doesn't want to attack the party because he's too weak and you know he's just gonna be in for a terrible time so definitely keep a lot of the actions and consequences in consideration when running this little encounter. And if you have any scumbags in your party that are trying to make that Shadow Blade real, that Shadow Blade turning into that blob should go ahead and strike whoever dared trying to get a permanent awesome weapon. How dare they? And it's here at the end we get some really good information on what Zan does if he lives. What does he do? Well, he, just like all the other Arcane Brotherhood members, want to get to the lost city of Yithrin. They want to get to the Necropolis. And he is going to go ahead and say, hey, I'm your buddy. Screw all those other Arcane Brotherhood people. I'm going to help you out. And once again, this is why I encourage you to introduce the Arcane Brotherhood early in the campaign, because they get to choose their alliances. Do they hang out with Xan? Do they hang out with Avarice, Nas Lantamir, or Velen Harpel? Whoever they choose as their companion in the Arcane Brotherhood, or don't choose any companion at all, is really going to shake up the future of the campaign. Zan, once he is real, is going to go ahead and head back to town and unfortunately go through the arduous process of making a new spellbook because sadly his spellbook is presumably burned alongside with him. And, you know, he's just going to go ahead and not head back to East Haven, especially if your players told him that, hey, you know, <laughs> you died, don't go back there. So he'll probably bounce around the other 10 towns and try and make a little living and, you know, make sure that his spellbook is on the up and up. And eventually he can be the catalyst for getting your players to the Lost City. And we get this cute little section on how he paints all of the other Arcane Brotherhood members in an unflattering portrait. He says that Avarice is this evoker who delights in destruction and doesn't trust anyone. How Nas Lantamir is a diviner that only looks to the future and not behind her. And Velen Harpel, who is this necromancer who doesn't care about anyone and she just uses her last name to get everything she needs in life. So really play up that rivalry between the Dark Brotherhood and just play up the interactions with the Arcane Brotherhood as a whole. There's a ton of fun things you can do with that and most important of all it is just such a better payoff if your players meet with these people who are going to influence them and direct them later on in the campaign to getting to the Lost City and of course combating Oriel. And for the 11th time in this campaign, we get this section on what happens right as your characters are about to leave the location. We get here that before your characters leave the spire, six bugbears show up. And the bugbears are basically going to announce their presence. They're going to be loud and boisterous. And they're just going to be coming in here to look for anything and complain about the cold. The leader of the bugbears, a one Breck, is a thug whose allegiance can be easily bought. If your players are willing to feed the bugbears or pay them in gold, their loyalty can be bought easy peasy. And your players can go ahead and have some bugbear companions along with them, which is a pretty dope gig. But if your players aren't really feeling that, they don't have gold to spare, or they just don't feel like tagging along with bugbears, then presumably an altercation might take place. Your players could also just simply pay them a little bit of gold to have them go somewhere else, only needing 10 gold to go away. Easy peasy. Adding this bugbear incursion doesn't really add too much to the game unless you want your players to get interacted with the bugbears. But one thing I would strongly recommend is maybe instead of this being bugbears, you actually have a presence out in the wilderness. This could be, instead of bugbears, could be one of the ragged nomad tribes. It could be a tribe of the elk or the bear or the tiger. You could do certain things to actually tie in other parts of the campaign because sadly bugbears never come up throughout this entire campaign really. In conclusion, I like the Lost Spire of Netheril. I like how it's an upside down dungeon. You know, it's pretty unique. You don't get to see that too often. And you can really play up the fact that this place used to hold some great magic, but is sadly withered away due to time. You, of course, can play up how Xan is getting bored here, just sitting around waiting for someone to show up who is dead. And then, of course, you can have that existential crisis of, oh, I'm dead. I want to become alive and, you know, become real. And then, of course, you can play up the fun little side bit of Krintas is just this undead servant who's just chilling around here. You can do a lot of great things, and, of course, your players can go ahead and be as scummy as they can, trying to make things come to life and all that. And you can have the entire machine blow up. You can have Xan truly become alive, or you can have Xan become some hideous blob that attacks the party. 
you can do so many fun things with this and once again this is just great foreshadowing for the future to come i love this area and i think it is absolutely fantastic and i totally hope that you push this on your players